should be right we should be live in a few seconds uh because we missed out the first few seconds of the last one with big paul so hopefully hopefully by now i'll give it a couple more seconds because it takes 10 or 15 seconds to come on stream okay hopefully we should be okay now and people can start to hear us in a few seconds if not then we've really messed up which i normally do i think i think we're okay well i think we're live i think everything's okay i'm hoping people can hear us because i can see that there's people a load of people suddenly on so right okay hello everybody thank you for joining in today and i'm really really pleased we've got chuck dechara with us right i've known chuck for quite well, about 10 12 years yes, sir. um training in over in massachusetts and Chuck trains a load of people all over the country, DT stuff, lots of high level training stuff. It's been SWAT leader for yonks and yonks and yonks, and he's got a ton of stuff. So welcome Chuck, great to have you with us. Oh, my pleasure. Great stuff, great stuff. So do you mind if I start asking you a load of questions that people have got already? Yes, sir, but I'm, um, I'm gonna have to explain the accent first. So if you can't, if people can't understand me, the pilgrims landed in Massachusetts, which means my version of the Queen's English is perfect, and everybody else is all screwed up, just so you know. That's what they kept saying when I was over there. <laughs> right. Now, then we'll start at the beginning. Um, pretty simple question. A few people have asked, why become a law enforcement officer? Well, I... One of those, uh, everybody has their own uh, personal reasons, I guess, but yeah. it's, um, I still, to this day, I've, I've been on the job now almost 32 years, and I still think it's the, uh, it's an old school profession. It's an honest profession. It's, I still love my job after all these years. I, I, I highly recommend it, but it's one of those professions, you know, it sounds goofy, but it's more or less a calling. You feel like the, you feel the need to go into something that's for the greater good and, you know, it's one of those jobs. It's it's not for everybody. Yeah. I, I say it all the time. I love the job. It doesn't always love you back. It's a, it's a hard job, but at the end of the day, it's an honest job. And I think if you go into this thinking that you can actually, one of the few professions you can make a difference actually every day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And too many people don't realize what work that you guys do and how much risk you guys take every single day. And, you know, being fortunate enough to be a DT instructor all around the place, lots of different countries, and meeting so many people like yourself. Yeah, I, I get the second hand news of just the sort of work that, that yourself and your fellow officers do and how underappreciated you are so often. And I just want to make sure that you know that you're underappreciated from this end and all the people that we know. We know what sort of tough work it is and it's real appreciate. No, we then, appreciate that. There's um now um the next one onto that was why SWAT? Oh well I, I was I was fortunate enough um when I got onto the department that I had done pretty well in the academy and they were they had they had some openings they were looking for some younger guys and at the time I honestly I was I was a young kid I really I really didn't know what the hell I was doing to be honest with you but I I was able to Getting on a team, there was a lot. I, I wasn't in the military, but a lot of the officers were. We had a lot of Vietnam vets at that time. That's how old I am. I've uh, been around a while, but um, so I got into the SWAT team just kind of looking for that extra step. I wanted the extra training. I wanted to work with 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 good people. I wanted to um, you know get out there and do really cool stuff. So I, I think I was maybe when I first got into the department, I was a little bit. I don't want to say disappointed, but it's the only way I could say maybe a little bit disappointed. I thought that, you know, everybody was really going to love the job and love catching bad guys and, and, and working out and, and doing all those things, going to the range to shoot. And I found kind of quickly that wasn't the case. So uh, when I saw there was an opening on, on the SWAT team and the tactical team, I figured those were the type A guys that really love the job. Those, those, you know, guys that really did it for different reasons. And that's why I decided to get on the SWAT team in the beginning. Fantastic, fantastic. And um, how long did it take you to train up to be a SWAT guy? 
I'll say swap guy, but you know. Well, prob probably a solid two years of, of, of training just to get on the team. But there's a um, there's checks and balances. When you're on the team, you're not on the team. You you you're on probation for 18 months. You're yeah. pretty much driving the van for the first year, and then you're on perimeter for a few years. So the whole process takes probably five years before you really get to do anything. So um, it's, right. it's a it's a it's a process. So I'd say two years to get on the team, but after that, it was I almost had to rethink the way I I thought as a police officer. Right, right. So it's a lot more training than people think, because uh, you know people think you join up and you're on the team and that's it. You know? Right. So um, we get for the people asking about tactics and stuff like that. We will be getting on to that. I've already had a lot of questions in about tactics and stuff, but we just want to give some background first for people, for those who don't know and don't understand just how much training goes into it, just how much experience Chuck's got and the kind of things that you go through to get to where Chuck is, I think it's important that we all understand that it's not just a walk in there and, hey, I'll join up and, and that's it. It's very, very different. And um, now, having trained as a, doing DT work in lots of different countries, I know that in some countries they don't get hardly any training uh, for, to actually physically make the arrest. Um, and some countries it's 40 hours, some countries it's four hours, some places it's about six hours. It just varies dramatically. So over where you are, can you give people an idea of how many hours training an officer gets in when they're at the academy into actually making the arrest? So I think people would be surprised like I was when I got on to the police department. I thought everybody was going to be a skilled martial artist and and training all the time and it really is not like that so it's yeah. it's budget stuff it's time it's time in the academy but i would say my my answer is not nearly enough yeah. but to go to a police academy most of police academies about a ballpark about a thousand hours of all kinds of topics but uh the, where we're at now probably be 80 hours from start to finish to 80 hours to teach an officer how to make an arrest how to block yeah. a punch, how to throw a punch, use the baton, use the taser. It's 80 hours is about max for a police recruit. Right. That's that's a heck of a lot more than a lot of countries, I can tell you that. I know several countries where they get four hours of training. That's four hours. And that's it. <laughs> Go and arrest everybody. <laughs> and that's it. So at least that's something. But I, I, you know, I think that it should be regular ongoing training. I think, and and people like yourself who are always training, I think that's the the thin end of the wedge, so to speak. There's not that many like yourself that are always training and always trying to help others because you do a lot of teaching as well. I know, but but there's not many people training like like you and and your colleagues. Um, so the other question that we're going to was how much uh, DT training um, do the SWAT team get? compared to the normal law enforcement officer? So with, with our, we would call that one of our physical skills, similar to firearms. So we've changed um, the last few years. We've What we do is now we put the defensive tactics training on the individual officer. So we'll yeah. do, you know, we'll probably do eight hours a year of, of combatives where we're practicing takedowns and, and, and strikes and stuff on entries. Um, but we don't do a we don't do a ton of it. We, we're throwing all the equipment and pressure test some of the some of the drills and some of the techniques because obviously you know, fighting with equipment and forty pounds of gear on is much different. So we'll probably do that as one of our lesser skills. But the idea of it is similar to physical fitness and firearms and defensive tactics. Where we put it on the officer is we have limited training time. So we tell the officer it's on you to stay physically fit. It's on you individually to keep up with your shooting skills because at SWAT when we're at SWAT training. We have to train so many other things, team movements and yeah. force on force scenarios that we can't be teaching an officer to shoot or to stay in shape or is uh, combative. So that is a skill now that we tell them you have to do that on your own. And then when we come, we try to put it all together. Yeah. Well, here's the thing that uh, another thing people don't get uh, how difficult it is at your end at law enforcement is that not only you have to keep yourself fit strong blah blah and keep yourself trained 
But like you say, it's on you as the individual. So you've got your full week of work with shifts to do, plus all your other training to keep yourself in shape to do the job that you, they, they want you to do. And people don't appreciate the fact that you're doing that in your own time. You know? And I would, I would add, a lot of people don't know we 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 put our hands on and we fight way more people than we shoot. But people think because it's a SWAT team. You're always out there shooting at people. It's really not the case. A lot of times we're using de-escalation techniques, so less lethal options, but we go hands-on a lot more than we shoot. Yeah, yeah. Again, you know, people always think the wrong thing. They see one clip on YouTube or TV or something like that where they see a team going in, guns blazing, but they don't see the other hundred times where they've gone in and talked somebody down or gone in and... Right. You, you use not, not, as, not as sexy when you talk somebody into giving up, you know? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, so some more stories before we get onto tactics and stuff like that and uh, you have what you, you know, some stuff. But um, there's loads and loads of people wrote in before asking about uh, basically the same question. Well, two main, two main questions. Three, sorry. Sorry. Um, and then this can they, they all mix in with each other a little bit, but the scariest time you've ever seen I or been involved in or know of for SWAT not not a nasty horrible story, but just a scary one that was that finished okay. Just you know. Um you know, it, it's always a question that comes up and they they almost start to run into each other because there's been so many. So I'll I'll, I'll say for a just because the result was good. Um, we were involved with the Boston Marathon thing quite heavy, and uh, yeah. my team was uh, one of the uh, – we were right in the stack of making the arrest in Watertown Square of those two. Uh, I won't name them by name because I don't think they deserve it, but they're, uh, we were involved in the whole Boston Marathon and the uh, Watertown event and taking those brothers, both of them, into custody. Uh, that was a pretty pretty crazy event because we had been working – our schedules were – we were working around the clock, so we were, we were dog-tired working – 12 hour shifts, 24 hour shifts. And the night that the event kicked off, I was on the immediate action team assigned to a Bearcat. And we got involved in the event pretty quickly. And then the manhunt for the second brother that escaped, we were, we were looking for him 20 hours humping straight. So, um, and, and behind every bush and wow. in house we checked, we were waiting for the explosive devices. So it was a pretty stressful time, but I would, uh, I like the way Boston, police and the feds and everybody and the local cops handle the event. And because it was a, because it was a good resolution, I would say that it was one of the most stressful, but um, I guess uh, challenging, but uh, rewarding pilots that we've been on. Yeah. I can't imagine what that was like thinking that you could get blown up at any second. I mean, that's, you know, one thing, somebody swinging a punch at you. Another thing, somebody could be shooting at you, but it's a completely different story. You could be just blown up. I mean, it's, you know, but thankfully, like you say, it all came out okay. And, and what was on the other scale, other end of the scale, the, um, the, the dumbest, most stupid thing you've seen from a, from a, from a criminal. Oh God. There are a lot of crazy ones. We we did we had one um back in the back in the nineties there was a lot more like with drug dealing now, a lot of it is mobile now, mobile operations with cell phones and cars. But we used to hit a lot more houses and fortified crack houses and that type of stuff. And we had hit we'd hit this one kid. Um he had actually he was missing an arm because years ago he got he got ripped off and robbed in the Somebody robbed him of his drugs, which is always a big risk when we're going in that they think they're getting ripped. But uh, they robbed him and shot him with a shotgun and shot his arm off. And he lived. And back a year later, he was still dealing drugs again. He didn't learn his lesson. So he had had a big washing machine in front of the door. So we did a we did a kind of dangerous, but we did a window entry, which is pretty cool to watch. We put ladders up the side of his house and went crashing through his windows. It was like a third floor apartment, but it was pretty cool because when we, we went crashing through the windows, he had a big... He had the drug dealer TV, the widescreen TV, and uh, they were cutting up drugs and watching the TV show Cops. So it was almost like 3D cop, you know. They're, uh, they're, they're watching three-dimensional cops, and we come crashing into the window because nobody really did window entries back then. So it was pretty cool and pretty funny. So uh, he didn't get the he didn't get the 
you didn't get the memo the first time around. So, but you, <laughs> you see stuff like that all the time. It's a lot of fun. You, can, you can't beat those days. You, I would work for free on days like that. Yeah, I can imagine that. You just sat there watching cops, and next second, straight I'm through the window, window, third floor. Brilliant, brilliant. And then the flip side of that is, uh, what's the dumbest thing you've seen a fellow officer do? Funny, not in a dangerous way, but you know, just, just why did you do that type of thing? Let's see. I'm sure there's been a few. I guess you. I got to see what the statute of limitations is on some of these things. Huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, got to be too careful. Can't name anybody. Well, I'll say this because my buddy's now deceased, so he can't get in trouble. But we did a uh, we did a raid years ago, and this guy thought he was a real bad guy. And um, when we took him in the custody, waiting for the wagon, um, there was a thing of nail polish on the guy's uh, table, and my buddy decided to uh, take his gloves off and paint all his paint all his fingernails for when he went off to jail. Oh. <laughs> I don't know why he did it, but it was funny. It was a good one, but he can't get in trouble. He can't do anything to him. He passed away years ago, so uh, I'll, I'll tell you that yeah. one. But we see some pretty – cops do crazy stuff under stress, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's amazing what happens when people are stressed out. And, uh, yeah, so – but shall we move on to a couple of the other big questions that we've had in? Um, is the skills that you learn at SWAT, armed skills – how do they translate over to normal self-defense skills? And do they? Yeah, I, I, I think they do. Some of it is, um, you know, a lot of this stuff is, is managing stress, uh, managing the human body response to stress. I think yeah. you learn an awful lot about that because it's, uh, you're working in high-stress environments and it's kind of like when you're, you're watching a pro sport and you see, like, after you played for a couple of years, the game slows down for you. It's kind of the same when you used to operate in high stress. Um, you get better at conflict resolution. You pick up a lot of those pre-attack indicators, I, I think. And um, you learn to manage your breathing. Uh, you yeah. learn to manage your stress. That adrenaline dump that you get that you don't really understand in the beginning, you learn to manage that. You say, okay, I'm going to be I'm going to be bigger, stronger, and faster for about 45 seconds. And I'm going to yeah. be a puddle of piss and I'm going to be spent. So you use that, use that for, for your advantage. Now, okay. We're going to be fast and dynamic because we're going to get tired fast. So uh, yeah, a lot of, this, a lot of the tactics do relate to that, but a lot of it is just understanding the, the human response to violence and conflict. Yeah. Yeah. Which is something that not many people actually teach or, or understand. And it correct. I think that's the missing link. We need to do more, especially with the new breed of police officers that grew up a little different. That, that didn't go out there and get in street fights or play contact sports. Um, sometimes we teach too much of the, you know, we spend too much time how to block a punch and how to throw a punch when it's just as important understanding pre-attack indicators and, and target indexing and, and transfer of energy, <clears throat> that type of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, from, from the work I've done with DT people and in, in other places and the, the new lot coming through, it, like when you said a different breed, it just made me smile because they're very different to when I. It's not their up. fault. It's, it's bad parenting. It's not their fault. It's their parents' fault. But yeah. we, we got to work with it. And we hire some good young talented kids, but they missed they missed a lot of that stuff. Yeah, and that, they missed a good slap around the head when they were growing up. I think. <laughs> but that's yeah. just my. I say with the, with with a new with a new kid that doesn't have that upbringing. I say all the time, but we got to get him comfortable. If, if I can take a recruit and get him comfortable with four things, if I can get him comfortable talking to people, with conflict resolution, comfortable comfort with pain, um, comfort with putting their hands on people, and comfort with, with violence when it has to take place. If I can do those four things, I think I we hit it out of the park. That's all I would like. If we do comfortable with those four things, we're, we're doing something. Yeah. And it takes some doing to get people comfortable with that. It really does. It really does. So the, the mindset thing, that, that obviously yeah, the, the SWAT mindset is going to be different to a normal bar fight mindset because especially somewhere other than, the, other than a gun-owning country where guns could be there. But the mindset for a SWAT situation is going to be different to a bar fight situation. So 
one of the things that people keep asking is, is about how do you cope with this? How do you cope with the stress of that? And how do you cope with the stress of that? And for most most people, for the vast majority of people, it's, it's just a, somebody in a bar wanting to pick a fight with you or outside the chip shop on a Saturday night. But how do you cope with the stress knowing that those people in there either are for sure or 99.9% .9 certain they're armed and there's a very good chance they're going to shoot at me? Yeah, you know, it's um, the, the stress management. I think it comes with fear management and, and kind of it's it's a confidence thing, I think, is that, you know, you just train so much and you train for all the variables that you're, you're confident and comfortable that you can handle the, the stress. Um, yeah. But it's, um, you know, the, the stress is definitely there. I think a, maybe for me it's a personal philosophy and the way I look at it is, I'm working with uh, guys that are well trained, and yeah. well, I'll, I'll give you an example. So I'm, I'm no longer married because that's one of the drawbacks of my type of work. It's it's, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's a it's a relationship killer, but that's okay. But like my ex wife, who who was good, she used to say she was more comfortable with me going on a, on a high risk SWAT call out than when I went to patrol for my own police department. And the reason for that, and it's true, was because I'm working with guys that I love, that I'm close with, that are similar mindset that um, are well-trained and even though the situations were more dangerous, she would be more comfortable with, with me, with my guys. And with my own mindset, it, the way I look at it is when, when you're doing something that you love and yeah. you, you feel like you're living a righteous life and you, you don't, you don't really s sweat the small shit. You kind of say, okay, listen, we're well-trained for this. We're going to do the best we can. I'm with the guys I want to be with and we're going to give it, we're going to give it a hundred percent and it's going to work out and, in the back of your mind, you say, you know, it, it's it's nothing to be afraid of if you if you're kind of one of those. If you're living a righteous life, you don't worry about the small shit, you know. Right. Yeah. Great attitude to have. I mean, it, and also the fact that you've got people alongside you that you know and trust, and they know and trust you. you know, it's a it's a big mental thing to have. You know, people backing you up. You know, especially in a, you know, you bring it down to a barroom brawl. If you got somebody by your side who you can rely on in a barroom brawl you you feel a lot happier with it yes, sir. um um uh, robert's asking hello robert uh does legal liability present a significant hindrance in your work so yes it's so uh, for, for, from the SWAT world it's liability is 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 a huge thing now we um we do a lot of there's a lot of checks and balances we have to have a matrix um to made out to even before we can respond and it has to be like a check the boxes like almost like a scoring system for us to even be utilized so it's definitely in the SWAT world and we have to take pictures of everything injuries um but the fact of the matter with SWAT when we're there it's because we're, it's usually a really critical event so it's yeah. not I don't think it's that much of a thing now go to patrol and teaching young officers defensive tactics it's horrible because liability Liability drives the train, and it sh it shouldn't. And it's hard to teach officers that when when a police officer comes to work right now in 2020, his number one concern is not going home at the end of the day, and that's what it should be. Cops' number one concern is getting jammed up, like getting it talked to him, getting sued, and it's a constant battle to try to fix that because when when police officers are driven by liability, they hesitate to go hands on, they 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 hesitate to use force. And what I see is uh, I do a lot of expert witness stuff on the side, like um, testifying in court cases. A lot of times what I see is under response leads to over response, because instead of taking care of your business when you can, you hesitate and you use you don't use the right amount of force. And then it turns into monkeys in a football. And it's and those are the ones that end up on video look, looking bad. Yeah. Yeah. But yes. Like, liability like, sir, drives the train. Yeah, because they could have ended it earlier had they not been worried about the liability issue. And, and the, 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 the crazy thing is, worried about the liability makes the liability an issue later on most of the time. You know, it's what we've been covering in all our stuff for years. Is, is If you're going to do it, just do it. You've got to do it quick. And, and I, would ch I would challenge, like, uh, the, the people that are watching, like, a lot of times that... Uh, I'll say, and I, I taught this, I taught a use of force class to the, all the chiefs of police. And I said, a lot of times what, what people think is, is excessive force. It's not excessive force. 
it's excessive amounts of it's it's ineffective force. So it's it's the it's the ineffective knee strike that's not working, and you use 17 knee strikes. It's the baton yeah. strikes that's not doing shit because you're hitting him in a big beefy area, uh, not generating any power, and then you had to hit him 12 times with a baton. Whereas if yeah. you just did it good, did it right, and hit a good target, then it would be over fast and you would have a lot less issues. So I think for, from when you look at videos, please use the force videos, and you see that it went bad, look at it. And then most of the time I see that it's it's because it went bad in the beginning and it was ineffective force. Not excessive, it was ineffective. Yeah. And we, we, we've seen this a lot, and um, we had it in the teaching that we were doing. There was many videos and clips where – Officers were punching and punching and punching the suspect in the shoulder just to try and get the arm up, to weaken this shoulder to get the arm behind because it was a, an approved technique for that force that they were allowed to do. And like you said, it was so ineffective. They were sometimes hitting him 50, 60 times just to try and get the arm behind it. So we showed them a way to get the arm behind real quick. And this, but you're not allowed to kneel on anybody. So you're just awkward. You fell on it. Don't worry about it. And it, it's silly little things like that, like you say, where it's ineffective technique that gives often good officers a bad name because they're only doing what they're allowed to do. And again, possibly because of liability issues, they're thinking of the liability of not doing an approved technique and then end up in all sorts of bother because it's ineffective. Yes, they can't when, we, when we had you come out years ago for that, the pressure point strikes, it was, yeah. it was so good for what we do because it was it was ending uh, a conflict fast and dynamic with with one or two strikes to you know p target indexing picking the target hitting yeah. it with some power and having it be over and so a lot of the stuff that we took from that class was was really good with that you know it worked okay. out for us yeah yeah I mean it's, and so I said to uh, a lot of the officers that we dealt with all around is that you know, sometimes the boss whoever it was would say. I don't agree with hitting somebody in the head and then say, well, it's either that or shoot them. Right. You agree with shooting them. You agree with tasering them. You agree with hitting them with a baton, but you don't agree with slapping them around the face. What's wrong with it? You know, it's the lesser of all of those. It's just that it works so well, but there you go. Yeah. It's, but I'm so glad it was working well with you guys. And for those who don't know, Chuck is one of those Americans who can actually drink. Yeah. <laughs> I can. <laughs> yeah. I don't give myself a credit. I'm super cute, not smart, but yes, I can drink. Yes, sir. <laughs> because when I was over there, they took me for a beer, and I thought, here we go. Another load of Americans who can't, can't drink. I'll have two beers with them, watch them fall over, then I'll carry on. They had to take me back home. <laughs> it took you to a Red Sox-Yankees game, Fenway Park, historic, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, I remember <laughs> with with Dave and, and the two Daves. Yes, sir. I don't know if I can mention their last names, but I won't say it. But yeah. yeah. But we were right behind the the thing. I don't know what it's called. Sorry, right behind the the picture. Home bit. plate. Yeah, home plate. But you thought it was cricket or some shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Stuff like that. It was fun though. It was good. It was good. good I remember that. Right. Um. So. Uh, Dave's asking, the reason you're able to stay calm enough to perform in a life-death situation is because from your hard and realistic training, you trust your own skills will pull you through. Correct. Yep, my, yeah. my sk skills and, and, and the skills of the guys I'm working with. And then to chance as well. At the end of the day, what will be will be too, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's like it's the same thing in a, in – in all of training, isn't it? If you've trained properly and hard enough, you're without being overconfident or stupid, you're a hundred percent confident in what you can do. So as long as you've got that confidence without being silly with it, without being overconfident, you will perform. And if, if, you know, if it's a sporting thing, it's one-on-one, -on -one, the other guy wins, oh, he's even just better. But if, when you're doing your job, if you've got the right other people around you, performing as well, odds are you're going to come out on top because other people aren't training like you. They aren't working like you. They haven't got that same determination like you. You know, you should be out on top, touch wood, all the time. And thankfully with the training. 
if e ego comes into place, like I, I don't think after all these years, I don't think I figured it out. I, I'm, I'm always, I'm always like yourself. I'm always trying to find new trainers and new stuff. And I, I never think that I have it figured out. I always think there's somebody bigger and badder out there. So I think being humble and checking your ego and, and knowing that there's always more and seeking more information, I think is, uh, I think that's part of what, what drives the train for me is I just, I, I can't get enough of, of, of training and meeting other officers and, and learning from other people. So when you can check your ego and you don't think that you have it figured out, then your, um, your, 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 your brain can take in more information. I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, you know, I, I've, I've known so many martial arts guys and everything else all around. And the ones that do the best are the ones with that attitude of, I've still got loads to learn. No matter how much you know, there's still loads more to learn. And that's what's kept me going in martial arts is learning all the time and meeting people like yourself. And you know, when I was over with you guys, I was learning, watching you guys as well while we're, you know, I'm doing the class, but I'm learning as well. It's great. Absolutely fantastic. Um, uh, rag carve. I don't know what that is, but I'll just say rag carve. Does the fact you're armed in a SWAT team in a land of the gun affect your mindset when coming into a situation after all the non-lethal training you have been through to get where you are now? Shall I read that again? Because I need to read that again. Shall I, do you mind if I read that again, Chuck? Because I need to read it again. For yes, me. sir. Yes. I don't want to get it. Does the fact you are armed in a SWAT team in the land of the gun in America affect your mindset when going into a situation after all the non-lethal training you've been through? Hmm. You know, I would say a lot of times it affects your mindset, but it's everything is really with us. It's, it's terrain driven. It, so I would have to say it sounds like a cop on answer, but it's 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 terrain driven. It's situation driven. If we sometimes we separate suspect versus subject. So it, so. You know, for instance, we have a guy that just uh, took his family hostage in a hostage type um, barricade situation. And, you know, we, and, and he lets his family out. We know he's inside with a gun like then then your mindset is going to be be one thing. That's a, that's a bad guy that needs to go to jail. And, and that's you know, that's that's a criminal. Yeah. We also deal with a lot of these non-lethal situations where it's a it's a dangerous subject. So we'll call him a subject because maybe he hasn't committed a crime, but he's suicidal and he's armed with a weapon. So that's going to be an entirely different mindset. So those person, those people can hurt you, but we're going to treat them a little bit differently. And we're going to try to exhaust time, distance, space, tactics, less lethal operation. So the mindset's going to be a little bit different. So I would say that where your brain is at sometimes it's, it's, it's going to be situation driven. And that's, that's another one that people don't see often enough with SWAT is that you're dealing with a lot of situations like the potential suicide. It's not necessarily going in there, guns blazing, shooting the bad guys, <laughs> ripping the place to bits, blah, blah, blah. Often it's spending hours saving a life. Yeah, and, that, and again, I don't think the recognition is given enough to the work that you guys are doing like that. And hopefully more people will recognize that. Um, Tony, Tony in Czech Republic, right? Favorite techniques or principles that could be the, the defensive tactic stuff that we did over there, or or any 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 favorite technique or principles that you like to use. I'm assuming that'll have to be unarmed because we didn't cover any armed stuff because you do that anyway. Yeah, you know, like um, the, the pressure point stuff was good for us. Uh, it took us a long time, liability wise, uh, where we where we police officers they. They really try to avoid the neck, so um, we were able to get the brachial stun in as a technique. I think yeah. it's fast, it's dynamic. I think it's easy to teach and replicate, so uh, that's pretty fast and dynamic. And then you you probably think we get a lot more training in the in the high speed fancy stuff, but we don't. And really, it's about uh, power development, how to throw a punch, and where to throw a punch and a kick. And we don't have um, you know what. what we might teach one or two kicks and try to teach them well versus yeah. 17 kicks, different kicks. You know what I mean? So we have such limited training time that we really stick to basics. And based on my experience under stress, the basics work and the yeah. high speed, cool, sexy stuff, man, unless you're doing it all the time, like some of you guys are and some, some of the people you teach there, uh, I've trained a lot with some of the offices in other countries and 
um, Sweden, Switzerland, the high, very high speed martial artists. And they do some really cool stuff. And I'm like, do you really do that on the street? Because I don't, I don't know if I could, I don't know if I could pull it off on the street. You know what I mean? So I'm just a ham and egg guy, you know? So there's some cool stuff out there, but I, based on what I've seen in 32 years as a cop, basics work and some of the sexy stuff, you, you don't really pull that off under stress. No. And, and I always say, why try and if, you, if you're good enough, to do the really fancy, sexy technique, why not just slap them and knock them out and be done with it? <laughs> That's what I say. So, yeah. but I seem to remember you liking a leg sweep. Oh yeah, because you knocked me unconscious with the leg sweep. You knocked me out with a liver shot, and you knocked me out with the BA out of the body alarm response once, and then you knocked me out with the leg sweep. But yeah, the leg sweeps are good for us because our hands are tied up a lot. The leg sweeps I thought were excellent, and yeah. um. We don't do too much with the head butts, um, but yeah, the leg sweep was really good. We got the leg sweep banned. Um, we had a place with the, there was 60 officers training and that big thick wrestling mats, like at one of the places we trained at. And yes, um, um, there was, I think some, some, somewhere in the region of 42 concussions from the leg sweep. <laughs> so they I said, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. First hand. Yeah, I'm sure a few guys had a leg concussion that week. Um, and Dave's asking, how do you train realistic enough to feel confident to deal with the worst case shoot them up when you obviously can't shoot each other for real in training? And then there's a second question is, how close to real is enough to be prepared? So, so the, well, the first, uh, the first one, one thing we've really evolved in is um, we do kind of a, uh, a lot of our, uh, We'll pressure test everything now. So we do a lot more force on force scenarios now. So yeah. we can take the bolts. We take the bolts out of our rifles. We put a blue bolt in and we put some, um, you know, we put some high speed uh, simunitions rounds in there. They're, they're the, the, the rifle rounds. They're cooking. Like when you get hit, you, you feel it and they penetrate sometimes. So we do a lot of force on force training. So we don't, we'll, we'll do some dry stuff um, just to, you know, review our techniques, but then when we do scenario-based training, so typical SWAT training day, we'll run, we'll uh, run through a couple tracks dry, and then we'll uh, everybody puts their gear on, and then we do a lot of uh, force-on-force simulations training. So it's uh, it's pretty realistic. The only thing you can't really replicate is the stress of, you know, it hurts to get hit with a sims round, but yeah, you know, you're just gonna get dinged, you know, versus getting shot. So you can't really replicate the intensity, but we can replicate a lot of the training and stuff. And what's yeah. the second part of the question? And the second part is how close to real is enough to be prepared? I suppose that's answered in the training that you're doing. Yeah. You know, you're, 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 you're confident. It's, it's, it's as realistic as you can make it, you know, is, is yeah. the best way I can answer that. You know, um, you got to be conscious of injuries. You, you always see there's a, there's a fair amount of injuries. And if, if we're training one way and we start losing guys to injuries and the, the chiefs and the bosses get mad, so we have to tone it down. But yeah. um, I, I would say the training is, is pretty realistic. I would say, you know, it, it, it can always be better. Yeah. Um, but it's as much as we can make it. A typical, we get uh, 16 hours a month training time. So basically every other Wednesday is a training day for us. So we get 16 hours a month training time and 40 hours of in service a year where we send the whole team off for a week. So we, I would say we do pretty well. I think we should do more, but I think we do. Okay. Yeah. But that's still a lot more than, than most, isn't it? Most people yeah. are getting yep. near that. Plus you're doing your own training in your own time as well to supplement all of that. And for the people who don't know, the training that you do in your own time is unpaid training and they pay it out of their own pocket. Right. And again, people don't realize what, what officers are going through in their training and realism and stuff like that. It's the biggest question people get in, especially in martial arts, you know, how do you know it's going to work? Blah, 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 blah. Well, if your training's right, you, you know, if your techniques work or not, you don't need to, you know, you don't need to whack somebody around the head as with every ounce of strength you've got with a baton to know that hitting them with a baton is going to work. You don't need to hit them that hard in training. You can hit a bag or something else and then, practice getting in on them so we always say you know there's a line you got can't cross in training because right. you wouldn't have any training partners right yeah and it's a fine line too because you want to pressure test it so that 
you know that it works. And the only way it works, you know, if you do it and it, wor- and it works for you, that you have confidence. But if somebody does it to you and it <laughs> and it yeah. gets your head right, then you say, okay, that that that's really good. But you know, we try to pressure test as much as we as we possibly can within within reason. Yeah, yeah, and and you can never replicate fully what it's like, even a bar fight. You can't replicate that fully what it's like until you're having a beer and somebody throws a punch at you or just smacks you, and then you're it's like game on. It's that simple. So, to me, realism is is one of those things you can never really do it, but you can train yourself as close as you can whilst remaining safe. Because, like I said, if you guys are injured, you're out of work. And, you know, and or you're going into a situation where you're carrying an injury, which is could be potentially lethal for you. Yes. If, it, if it slowed you down that little bit because you're injured, you know. Um, uh, same uh, rag cars asking, are you allowed to preemptively hit somebody, e.g. a power slap to gain faster non-lethal control? So the press don't give the public the wrong message. Yeah, they're covered by law. You're allowed to hit first. Same, same laws of self-defense as we have. I would say the same thing. Yeah, it's you know you don't, you don't you don't have to wait to get kicked in the balls. I always say, you know what I mean. Like if you yeah. if you feel if you feel an, if you feel an assault or attack is imminent, which is means assaultive behavior to me means doesn't mean assault is take necessarily taking place. It could mean it's about to take place. So. I think by law, but you're going to have to articulate it and explain it because that's where the liability comes into play. But uh, a lot of that is just, you know, being able to articulate what you did in those pre-attack indicators and you're okay in that scenario. In, in most countries, if you have, and it, it's the same in America because it, they got, you got your common law based off English common law. If you've got an honest old belief that you are about to be attacked, you are allowed to hit first. It's, it's having that, and that's not to be abused. That that honest held belief, but that is the the law. If you've got an honest held belief, you're about to be attacked. You are allowed to hit first, which doesn't mean you keep on hitting forever it's, until the threat is over. Yeah, but, as long as you stick to what's what's reasonable, and I know we, we go by case law, but at the end of the day, that's that's going back to caveman days. That's written on the caveman walls. You're you're allowed to yeah. defend yourself as a human being. That's what I always said to people. Sometimes. Chopping the head off with a samurai sword is still self-defense. And other t- times, pushing them on the chest this hard is assault. It just depends. You never know in the situation and whatever. It's whatever is deemed necessary at the time. Um, another thing people asked asking earlier was about press and that. Is it ever in the back of your mind what the press will do if they found out what, you know, if they were watching a particular up or whatever or a situation that you were in do you ever have in the back of your mind you're worried about the press or video cameras or anything like that or do you just get on with your job and worry about it later well it's it's always there the video cameras are everywhere now so yeah. the way we look at it and like even now everybody's got these doorbell cameras like so i just try to say to my guys just assume you're on video camera every time just assume you're on video camera then you'll, you'll make good decisions and then you won't, you won't sweat it. You know, some guys get really crazy over people out there videotaping other press. I'm like, you know, the, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, a good use of force is still good. And you're going to have to explain when it doesn't look good, but uh, we try not to let it dictate what we do, but it's, it's 2020, man. So it's a thing, you know, yeah. I would say that I'm, I'm a patrolman. I'm a, I'm a ham and eggs guy. Like, I don't sweat that stuff. I would say maybe my boss is sweating more than I do. You know, the way yeah. I look at it is we, we do what we're supposed to do and let the chips fall where they may. But I guess from a risk reward, risk liability, there's probably people uh, above me that sweat that. But yeah, that's why I've never took a promotional exam in 32 years. I don't want to be a boss. I just want to go and have fun and do the job. Yeah, that's the way it is, isn't it? Yeah, uh, Rob was asking, what do you recommend to help manage a high stress encounter? So you don't do something you would regret later. And Robert says, "Quick prayer, then commitment." Sound good? Yeah, yeah, that that works. Um, you know, I think breathing is always good. You know, having good breathing techniques, but I have a lot of visualization te- techniques. Like, so you visualize a lot of these things, 
ahead of time. So if we're if we're set up on a, a SWAT caper or, or, or an armed barricade, we try to do the like to me this is a, to me this is not a knuckle drag a tough guy thing. It's a it's a thinking man's game. So yeah. if we have a scenario, we try to not leave anything to chance. We try to go. So I know nobody wants to hear that Tom Brady's the best quarterback of all time, but he is. But it's because he's so smart. So I'll give you an example. So when Tom Brady goes up to the line of scrimmage, he's like, he's got plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D, and it's and he's seen the game before. So he, he when something changes, he just flows into the next variable. So I think that's a lot of just mental preparation. So what happens if you don't do that, then you run up to the line of scrimmage, and when the play breaks down, you run around crazy. So I think a lot of the stuff – so if we're set up on, the, on an event – we're going to sit there and, and we're not just sitting in a stack for two hours, you know, talking about where we're going drinking. It's like, okay, if he comes out and he, and you do not see a weapon. Okay. You hit him with the taser, you go hands on, you freight train his ass with the shield. Good. Okay. Good. Or if he opens the door, he's got the weapon. You're the lethal cover guy. If he tries to climb out the window, we're going to do this. If he comes out fighting you and you go hands on and I'll grab the shield. So, you try to you try to play out all the variables ahead of time so that you don't overreact. It's kind of one that the OODA loop, you know, if you if you yeah. if your brain has already been there, then when yeah. it happens, you're faster and more decisive. I think that stops a lot of overreaction to it. The other thing too is experience too. We don't take a lot of you would think we get a lot of young kids that are shit hot, 22 years old, you know, run like a dear 400 pound bench presses, piss and vinegar, but we really don't take those guys. We actually have a, a, our average age on the team is probably 40 years old. We got guys that are experienced work in, in police work. So uh, it doesn't matter if, if I'm two seconds slower than some 22 kid running up the stairs, if I know what the hell I'm doing. So we, uh, we try to take a more experienced officers. We don't take brand new guys. So you have to put some time in. So I think that helps a lot with the over response or reacting badly to a, a stressful situation. Yeah. And that, you yeah, know, that experience is something that you can't, you can't buy, can you? Because whenever you got a situation that even if it's down, back down to a barroom brawl, you want the experienced guy at your side, not the not the one going wild, crazy, who probably end up getting in the way. You know, it's a, there's a lot to be said for that experience. And from our experience of going around doing DT stuff, it is the older guys that pick stuff up quicker, actually, and they're able to use it. And the, the younger guys who like you say, pissing vinegar all the time. There, they like they're already they already know everything. I call them Google because they already know everything. But there you go. It's just the way we we go yeah. on with it. Yes, sir. But, uh, but the um, again, it's back down to that training, isn't it? Because you've trained it properly, and you you're training high stress training, training correctly, and people are training together, and as a team as well as individually, it, it reduces all of those risks and. Yeah, I also found that I had it with people. We were doing um, a lot with some debt collection people, not in a not bad debt collectors, but right. proper ones. And um, one of the guys on the way to going to get a car, he kept on talking about stress and what it does to people because he'd read some books on it, and he talked himself into a situation. When we got there, he's shaking like a leaf. And he, he just couldn't perform. He just sat in the he was sat in the car like that, and it was cold. Leave him there. And that, it's a weird how stress gets to people. Things like that. And then so another one that we had um, was the was was it why I can't read that writing very well. That's my most scribbled it down to put it here. But it was along the lines of why do people. Um, want to become uh, why do people want to become SWAT and, and when they do want to become SWAT the ones that fail right we've already covered why but the ones that fail do they do they tend to go back to regular police work or do they just get out of town sort of thing um most of them stick it's it's a uh... Most don't leave the profession entirely. Most will find another avenue to go to. So, like I think, I think being a SWAT, I think it's the best job in the police department. As far as I, you know, I just I, I love it. I think it's a, I, I would do it for free. And people that yeah. say that whoever said you find something you love to do, like I feel like I'm embarrassed that they pay me to do this job. I, like I yeah. like it that much. 
but it's not but it's not for everybody so i think the people that take a shot at it and you know after a couple of years they're not really getting off the perimeter this it's not really clicking for them mentally like they can shoot they're physically fit but the game just too fast for them and they have a hard time uh, putting it together and they they wash out or they decide to go they usually go back to their own departments and and do something else they don't entirely quit the police department um, yeah so but they, they stick around but and then go back and usually do something else so it's, it's one faction of police work there's canine there's narcotics there's detectives there's so many other really cool jobs in the police department they just you know everybody kind of has to find their niche and you know the yeah, SWAT yeah. team is really not for everybody it's a different different breed of cat but you mentioned you mentioned a lot about the training and stuff you just yeah. really have to if you're a collect a paycheck guy and you're the guy that comes to work and says I'll, I'll, I'll do what they pay me to do and you're not doing stuff on the side all the time it's it really is a lifestyle you know you gotta you gotta try to drink water and eat supplements and get to the gym and sleep and shoot on your own so if you're not all in then you're not gonna it's not gonna work out for you yeah yeah now you, you do a lot of dt training yourself or teaching sorry a lot of instructing around and uh, just for those who don't know what do you do ever take in civilians or is it purely for law enforcement um, right now it's, right now it's for law enforcement just cause we're so busy with that. I teach a lot for Safari land. So yeah. I teach a lot of the defensive tactics and pepper spray and flashbangs, tear gas, that type of stuff. So mostly it's, it's police or the civilian stuff is security. So we'll yeah. do, um, hospital security guards, some, some bodyguard type stuff from here from time to time. But it's, uh, it's not that I wouldn't do civilians. I love, I love training anybody, but, uh, it's kind of like a time frame thing usually, you know? Yeah. Yeah, having the time to do it. Maybe, maybe in the future you will. Yeah, two more years I can retire. But we'll see. <laughs> right, see what happens. Um, last question for you. Right. What about post scenario stress management? Are you taught how to de stress and recuperate specifically, or are you left to do your own thing? So it's one area that we've improved since I've been around. So in the in the beginning, when I first got on the team, when I first became a police officer. Like, you would never you would you would learn to deal with the stuff yourself. You know what I mean? Um, you know, because if you if you if something was bothering you, they'd, they'd put a rubber gun in your locker or guys would write bathroom graffiti. Like guys would bust your balls pretty good back in the day. And and right, wrong, or different, that was the culture back then. So I would say the culture has improved a lot now. That now we kind of recognize it. It's great to go to the gym and shoot, but if your if your head's not right, you're no good to anybody. Um, I can remember I um, I was involved in a uh, active shooter event in uh, 2000, where there was um, seven people got uh, seven people got uh, murdered on a, on a workplace violence type thing. So it was a pretty bad it was a pretty bad scenario, and um, I you know I can remember get, getting done with that, and they were like, you know, they want to go see somebody. I'm like, yeah, no, I'm good. I'll I'll go have a beer and talk to my friends and stuff. And that was kind of the way. We did stuff back then. I think if it happened today, they'd probably take you up the street and, uh, you know, make sure that you just talk to a council and make sure your head was right. So um, we we have it available to us. The PTSD stuff is big in our in our yeah. in our profession now. I mean, I've had since I've been a cop, I've had seven of my friends commit suicide. I mean, it's it's a it's a real thing, you know. So wow. we're we're better at we're better at it than we used to be. But yeah, it's available to us. They're pretty good with it now. Yeah, that's terrible news. That's terrible news. Suicides. That's horrible. Horrible that you can be driven to that. Um, there was a couple of questions that we were sent in. And I don't. Do you, have you got time for a couple of quick questions? I get as much time as you want. Oh, great, great. Um, one of them was that in 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 their own country, um, if they're ordered to shoot, if they're ordered to shoot, I don't know which department they're in, but if they're ordered to shoot. If they discharge a weapon, they they are suspended afterwards until everything is sorted out, until full inquiry is done. Is that the same with yourselves? Yeah. So they'll they'll do if you're involved in any kind of an officer involved shooting, or even a significant use of force, um, you choke somebody yeah. unconscious or something. But uh, an officer involved shooting, the policy is that they will uh, take you off the street and put you on admin leave, and then until it's under investigation. And there's this steps. They'll um they'll have a district attorney's office do an investigation, and then um you get cleared to come back to work. There really is no time frame, unfortunately. If it, if if you shoot a person and they they die, 
you're going to be out of work longer. It's a longer investigation. If you shoot a person and they live, they go to the hospital, they get stitched up. Then you're, uh, once you go through the process, go see the doctor, you go to the range again, usually do another qual just to make sure you're, you're okay uh, in the head and stuff. But uh, yeah, if you, if you get involved in officer involved shooting, you're going to be out admin leave, no matter what the situation is. And everybody's the same, which is good because then it, you don't feel like you did something wrong. Everybody has policy and everybody has to go by it. You go to the hospital, mm-hmm. you get checked out and you go on admin admin leave yeah because in, in all the films of course everybody's back at work in the afternoon oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i think that distorts it i keep saying to people, no 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 you you're not going to be back at work it's it's a, a yeah. long i, I remember, remember I, sh- I i was teaching a class years ago and this is you know this is, again this is going back years and, and uh we were, we were taking everybody's weapons to do some defensive tactics training and the guy was like shaking and he was a he was a veteran guy i'm like bro what's the fuck's wrong with you and he's like Oh yeah, I was just I, I got involved in the shooting last night. I'm like, last night, <laughs> and they sent him to training the next day, and he smoked the guy. The oh. guy came out like Rambo, and he shot and killed the guy. And he, the cop was back to work like a day later. I'm like, oh no, that's not good. So we, <laughs> we don't do stuff like we don't do stuff like that anymore. Oh no, no, that's that's whew, that's horrible. A um, uh, couple more quick questions, if you're if you're okay, Chuck. Is- yeah, no problem, no problem, brother. How much do you credit your success to your past experience versus your natural ability to adapt? Oh, um, you know, I, I would, I don't know about natural ability. I, I don't know. I don't know. You know, I, I, I grew up playing sports and contact sports and I think that helped me the team atmosphere and the um, playing, playing football, you know, uh, helped me. But I tell you, I was, I really got humbled when I became a cop and I just, I don't think that anybody, I, I tell all the kids I train the Academy, like you can be, you can be a collective paycheck cop that just shows up, does a job. I got no problem with those people. Or you can be a, like a, like you can be a fucking game changer, you know? And it's, it really depends on what you want to do, but I don't think anybody's born like with this skill. So I tell every new cop, I'm like, listen, the best cops that ever walked the planet, you have what they have, which is two feet, <laughs> a hot, a, a brain, a ticker, you have a heart and like you can accomplish that. It, it just, it's, it's just self-motivation. Like if you want to be, I don't think anybody's born like a great basketball player, a great hockey player. I don't think it's God given. I think you just have to really just, uh, I think anybody can be a great law enforcement officer if they're driven. So I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I don't think it was just naturally for me. I think I really just found something I wanted to do and I, I, I sold out and I went all in and that's, that's just it. So I would probably put, I was lucky enough to train with great veteran cops that taught me a lot of stuff. And I always was, I was never one of those, like the millennials kind of tune you out a little bit now. Like, yeah, yeah, I know that. I was never like that. I'm like, show me, show me, teach me, teach me, like told me more. So I I, I like to say that everything that I've accomplished, I just was lucky. I was lucky enough to be around good people that told me the right way to do shit. Yeah. I've always find that people who are lucky enough to be around the right people tend to be the people who, want to learn more and keep saying I want more I want more and they work hard and train hard something like you've done it's that it's always seems to be those people and I think it's make your own luck because you train that so hard and you're you're willing to learn all the time and it's few and far between you know people like yourself few and far between um the, the last one if you're okay with this joke is uh, give us some tips about hardcore mental strength in times of crisis and emergency situations. That's from Rajnish. Sorry if I've messed your name up, Rajnish, but that's how I've said it. Um, I'm not sure exactly what he's asking. Like just uh, for techniques or for mindset? Or? Oh, uh, I think it's more like mindset for some mental strength when things are bad. It, you know what? It's, it's kind of some of those... Um, some of those like the stuff that's been around for a long time, the, the way of that warrior stuff. So I think that I think being good in the head and spiritual wise, like I believe truthfully, I, I, belief in the family, like belief in your last name and, and, and living a righteous life goes a long way. Uh, believe, no matter what God you pray to, I won't talk politics, uh, believing in a higher power, uh, believing in the mission, believing in what you're doing. I, I think that's it for me because I just think that, it's uh, it gives you an inner, it gives you an inner peace or an inner, uh, an inner nobleness to walk around knowing that you're doing the right thing and you're living a righteous life because then you don't worry about what happens. You hey, listen, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, if I have to deal with a bad guy, he's gonna get my A game and 
if it ain't good enough, it's not good enough. But I did, I did the right thing and I looked out for my family and God. And, and it's kind of one of those, uh, I think mental, the you know, mental toughness comes from a lot of just understanding that way of the warrior stuff. I believe it. I believe that they start in, in the United States, they started trying to make us stop teaching the, the warrior mindset and start teaching, well, stop telling these kids that they're warriors, that we need to be guardians. I'm like, well, you can be both. Like it's, it's, that's semantics. Okay. Apples and oranges. Guardian, I don't know what you call it, but I just know I like, I know that I have a, a, a love of my fellow man and I have a propensity for violence when it's necessary. And I'm good with that. And, and, uh, you know, you believe in God and yourself and the, and the mission. I think if you believe in the mission, I think you're going to fight harder and, and better. And I think it will relieve some of your stress. Cause at the end of the day, when you're going through a door and you're like, Hey, listen, like, I, I, I have a tattoo that says, it, you know, send me. You know what I mean? Here I am, send me. Okay, Isaiah. Here I am, send me. And if you have that mentality that that you're the guy that wants to do it, then it helps you perform better under stress. Yeah, uh, that is one of the best answers I've ever heard for that. Thanks, chat. That's it. And people are saying thank you. And Robert is, is humble to hear that as well. I mean, it's, it's a, you know, that, that, that attitude is one that, unfortunately, you don't hear enough of for, about law enforcement people. And and I'm sure, you know, it's not just Chuck who's got that attitude, right? You know, the people around him, the people he works with will be of a similar ilk, you know, and, and officers all around the country and all around the world, there'll be people with that similar ilk. And I think it's high time that law enforcement, we're, we're giving the credit that they deserve, especially people like yourself. And um, Chuck, I, I don't know how to say thank you for your time today. I know you're super busy. I know you've got so much going on with everything. And it's been an absolute pleasure to see you again, chat with you. And yeah, hopefully we'll, we, hopefully we'll we catch up in Virginia Beach this week. But do, do me a favor to all, all your listeners and stuff. I, 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 yeah. I love doing this. It's a pleasure for me to talk to people in other countries and other lands and stuff. And I, and I love doing that. So like I say, if you ever want to go on in the future, let me know. We'll pick some different topics, but it was good to catch great. up. And uh, you know, yeah, my respect for everybody. That, appreciate everybody taking the time to check it out. Yeah. Thank you, Chuck. And it's great to have you on and great to have you on board and everybody, you know, when Chuck starts teaching civilians, people got to go there and learn because 30 odd years of, of Chuck's training to get what he to get some of the knowledge that he's got is be amazing for you. I need a road trip. You got to bring me somewhere. Let's go somewhere. Philippines, Cambodia. Where are we going? I'll take a road yeah, trip. Yeah, we got to do it, man. We got to do it. My house Check. is yours, Check. The guy from Czech I'll go visit him. I like Czech. Yeah, you just come over. Come over here. My house is your house. You know that. You're welcome anytime. That's it. Simple as that. Everyone else yeah. is on lockdown. We're allowed to go where we like. <laughs> It'd be great to see you. You well. Thank you, everybody, and Chuck. Thanks again. All right. Yeah. All right. Thanks, I, folks. Take care. God bless. Hopefully you'll, you'll come back again another time. I promise. Great stuff. Thanks again, Chuck. And thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.